Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're gonna build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? It was a car that was ahead of its time. A forward-thinking but eccentric man designed it. It had a meteoric rise and crashed just as fast before becoming an iconic part of film history. John Z. DeLorean created the DeLorean to be a sports car for the masses. It featured some unique traits including gullwing doors and a stainless steel body. But pushing it out too fast in 1981 led to delays, performance issues, and killed the car until it was featured in Back to the Future in 1985. And don't worry, we'll get all into Back to the Future, but not just yet, because this is a pretty crazy story that involves fraud, government investigation, drug dealing, you name it, it's in the story of the DeLorean. So before we start, if you're new here, thanks for coming on out. If you've been here for every episode, welcome back. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe just so you get the shows automatically sent to you. That's all taken care of then. Okay, let's get past all that and get to the DeLorean. So, like I said, there's a lot of interesting story to cover here if you've never heard this tale before. And this tale is as much about the meteoric rise of its creator before his fall from grace. If this is all new to you, you might not have known that DeLorean was a real person. John Z. DeLorean. It wasn't just a car. So the car itself started out okay, But it had a rapid crash. And then, of course, thanks to a certain movie, it would live on forever. And like I said, it it features a a story involving passion and government involvement and all that drug trafficking. And the best is to start with John Z. DeLorean himself. And honestly, look this guy up if you want to read some amazing stuff. He's like taking Elon Musk, Tony Stark, and Steve Jobs and throwing them into a blender. He had the playboy persona of Tony Stark. He had the ingenuity of Elon Musk and a Steve Jobs-like fixation on the tiniest of details. He grew up in the heart of the automotive industry in Detroit, Michigan. He had a rough upbringing in the 1920s, but was able to make something of himself when it came to education, and he landed a college scholarship. He spent some time in the Army and then rose quickly with the Packard Company, where he was head of research and development, despite only being in his early 30s. He would end up working for the Pontiac Car Company and help to design one of the greatest cars ever, the Pontiac GTO. He would also work for Chevrolet before becoming a corporate member of General Motors. He was almost at the level of president of General Motors before deciding he wanted to branch out on his own. You may notice how the DMC logo on the DeLorean always looks similar to GMC. I don't know if you ever picked up on that. Uh, That was a combination of maybe a tribute to them, but also maybe a slight dig at the same time. When it comes to the Tony Stark side of John DeLorean, he had a Hollywood look about him. He had this extreme charisma and he wore these amazingly flashy suits compared to more of the stuffy nature of the corporate car world at the time. He schmoozed with the rich and famous, he dated supermodels, he even ended up marrying one. But instead of working for other people, he wanted to be his own boss, and he wanted to leave his own legacy when it came to cars. Just as Elon Musk would do decades later, John DeLorean would branch out and take the enormous risk of starting his own car company. Just like Elon Musk, he immediately went to work on what would be their flagship vehicle, a two-seater sports car. Now let's look at the start of the actual DeLorean Motor Company. The DMC was really like the Tesla of the day, and with word spreading of his new car company, DeLorean was able to recruit the best of the best in the world of cars. Everyone wanted to work for him. They wanted to challenge the status quo of the automotive world. These best of the best are also bringing along their protégés, and these protégés are the ones that now run the global automotive industry. Despite being gone for more than 30 years, much of what is happening in the world of cars today is because of the people who worked for DeLorean. 
The company was officially founded in 1975, and he raised the money through some of his celebrity friends, including Johnny Carson and Sammy Davis Jr. DeLorean, however, was thinking that getting a factory up and running could be assisted by a government. Despite being based in Detroit for most of his life, DeLorean would end up negotiating with different countries around the world to produce his car. Puerto Rico was in the running for a while before he decided on Northern Ireland, specifically Belfast. This was basically to allow him to get a majority of his funding from the government as opposed to using their own capital. So how was this car put together? And this is where it gets interesting. The goal of the company was to create a high-end car that would take on the likes of BMW. The design of the DeLorean goes back to 1974, and John DeLorean had only four specific requirements. One, it must have gullwing doors. Two, it must have a mid-range engine. Three, room for a larger-than-average person. John DeLorean was over six feet tall. And four, it must be made of stainless steel with no paint. Why was he so specific, specifically the stainless steel and the gullwing doors? In DeLorean's mind, he knew that to be a brand new car, it had to have some unorthodox features that made it stand out. Due to his Steve Jobs-like fixation on the quality of the product and how every aspect must be flawless, the process of developing the DeLorean was an extremely drawn-out ordeal. He stated that, quote, poor quality threatens to destroy us. Every defect, each recall, only diminishes the credibility of whatever amount of advertising we do, unquote. Again, if you know anything about Steve Jobs, that could be directly taken from him too. Basically, the car needed to be perfect. Creating a custom engine became very difficult, and they had to use an alternative that was also being used by companies like Volvo. This engine would have to be placed at the rear of the car, which would compromise its handling. They wanted to get this car out as quickly as possible, which meant they did cut corners. Since they were taking too long with the chassis, they went with one that was used on a Lotus Esprit. This would also influence some of the stylings. And if you don't know what a Lotus Esprit looks like, you're going to have to do a quick Google image search wherever you are right now or, or check it out after. You'll probably notice how similar it looks to a DeLorean. There had been a large amount of unemployment in Ireland going into 1979, and a majority of those who worked on the DeLorean, now officially called the DMC-12, as the company wanted to sell it for $12,000. These people had never had a job before, let alone manufacturing cars. This obviously led to quality control issues, not to mention a massive amount of delays. You've got people who you know, at best maybe had a job working in a fast food company, but most of them didn't work because of all the unemployment. So, I mean, getting someone up to speed on a fast food process would have been hard enough, let alone designing and manufacturing a car. Unlike Elon Musk, who would sleep in his factory to ensure the early survival of Tesla at the start, DeLorean would spend most of his time in New York trying to work with dealers and spread the word of his new car. The UK government was told that production would start in May 1980 and they would have 30,000 ready to go in 1981. But it would take until December until production began and the first car didn't come off the lot until January 1981. So let's look at some interesting specifics on the car. And again, if you've only known it from the movie, it's worth, you know, again, having a look at, if you go on YouTube, you can see some early like test drive videos of it and you can get a little more look at the nuts and bolts of this whole car. So the thing with the DeLorean is he, he was trying to go head to head with General Motors. So he had an entire range of DeLorean cars envisioned. He wanted this not just to be the car you know of, but everything. He had some design models that were going to include a four-door model. There was going to be an SUV Jeep type uh, DeLorean. There was even going to be a bus version of a DeLorean. Again, similar to the approach that Elon Musk is making with Tesla. It, so, I mean, th this story really mirrors itself between Elon Musk and John DeLorean. And we all have to admit that, you know, when you saw the first images of that Cybertruck Tesla put out, you had to think it looked like a tank version of a DeLorean. But this was what was going to happen with that original DeLorean car. There's going to be a whole line. John DeLorean wanted every car on the road to be a DeLorean, whether it was like a family minivan, the regular sports car, the buses, the trucks. He wanted to take over the entire automotive industry. 
So I mentioned the interesting facts about the specifics of the car. Here's a few. The gullwing doors caused some issues with windows and they had to install what they call a toll booth window. Just that short little flap thing and it took up a smaller portion of the overall window. That was the only part you could wind down. This little like almost square foot. The doors themselves were made by technology ended up being used by the defense industry. That's how advanced those things were. The best way, believe it or not, to clean that stainless steel exterior was with gasoline. (laughs) They located the gas filler cap on the hood with the first versions of the DeLorean. This was thought to look really ugly. So future editions would put it under the hood, meaning you had to lift up the hood anytime you needed to fuel up. A massive pain. It was actually advanced When it came to environmental issues, it was seen as being the ethical sports car in that it was ecologically sustainable. It would be better on gas and last a lot longer than regular cars. Again, I don't know if he had the foresight to see where the car industry was maybe going to go and emissions problems and all that sort of thing. I, I doubt that was the case. But again, if DeLorean had it his way, every car on the road was going to be a DeLorean. So how are you going to market this thing? The easiest way to sum up the marketing promotion for the DeLorean was live the dream today. The specific looks of the car were the key part of the marketing process for it. The first time the DeLorean was shown to the public was the Belfast Auto Show in 1981 and people went nuts. It looked like something from the future and every camera and member of the press at the event was focused on this new car. This was the goal of John DeLorean. Make something unique and it should be able to sell itself. This response continued throughout all of 1981, anytime it was displayed, but it still needed to be presented to a wider audience. Print ads helped to market what was now just called the DeLorean instead of the DMC-12. The focus of the DeLorean advertising would be on the concept of being high-end and that you would be living the dream by owning one. They wanted to market the DeLorean in higher-end publications such as American Express Magazine, and they wanted to appeal to those well-off. A limited edition, kid you not, gold-covered DeLorean would be offered to gold card members for the sweet price of $85,000. Converted for today, it's around a quarter of a million dollars. If you don't believe me, just, again, Google image search, gold DeLorean. This is a real thing, and it looks crazy. So this car is super hot, and in a pre-social media age, nothing could beat the hype and great word of mouth that was happening with this new car. Everyone always wants the latest and greatest. And with the DeLorean, they were selling the future, which is an interesting way to look at things now, knowing its legacy. But as mentioned before, there were some problems with this hastily put together car. Let's look at the big issues that concern driving this thing. Again, we all associated the DeLorean with speed, but it wasn't exactly a Bugatti Veyron. It would take nine seconds to go from zero to 60. And this put a lot of speed-based, you know, gearheads off this car. They thought it was a legit sports car. The weight distribution was all thrown off because of the engine placement. Remember, he wanted a mid-range engine, but they had to put it at the back. And this created a crazy amount of handling problems that many complained about. They would fix some of these problems by installing turbos into the engine to boost the speed and get the 0-60 to time down to around 5 seconds. So, not bad. There's actually an interesting review from Car and Driver magazine that was printed on uh, July 1st, 1981 that you can still read in digital form. And it's really interesting to see them review this car. And they did ask the ominous question at the end of this review, wondering if it would be a technological marvel that turns out to be an economic disaster. But back to the car. It also had a lot of features that were pretty decent and revolutionary for the time, including power windows, telescopic steering, leather seats, air conditioning, tinted glass windows. So these were great features, but they were driving up production costs. The price for this slower, very poor handling car was also a bit of a turnoff. The original target price for the DeLorean, as I mentioned, was going to be around $12,000, but all those delays and production issues pushed it up to $25,000, or about $63,000 if you convert for today. So what's the early response to the car? 
The first few DeLoreans didn't exactly fly off the shelves, but they were starting to move based on the hype that had been built around it. The problem was people were having to wait for years to get one. Despite all that, the DeLorean was a hot item and everyone wanted to be the first to own one. For those first six months in 1981, the DeLorean would outsell Porsche and Mercedes in the US. In the UK, it would even outsell the iconic Jaguar. By the end of 1981, the company was already in trouble. This was a bad time to release a car as US automotive sales were now entering a depression. To break even, DeLorean needed to sell around 10 to 20,000 cars, but by the end of the year, they'd only sold 6,000. Things weren't much better in 1982, and even though the DeLorean was only intended for an American market, they tried to sell them in Europe. John DeLorean was looking for some UK assistance as they were now only operating three days a week. He pushed up the production from 50 cars a day to 80, and this was considered absolute like career suicide. Interest rates were a mess, a recession loomed, and the exchange rate between the pound and the dollar was a disaster. And at this point, the Irish government wanted out of this. So now, desperate times call for desperate measures. I guess, like many other extreme business people have done when faced with adversity, DeLorean went the drug route. A neighbor of his presented the idea of bankrolling a cocaine trafficking operation. Turns out that this was a sting done by the FBI, but absolutely looks like entrapment considering that the idea was brought to him and he didn't seek it out. The sting was captured in an L.A. hotel room and John DeLorean was charged in 1982. This pretty much halted everything to a complete stop. Turns out that this actually was entrapment and they had to drop the charges against DeLorean. But by then, the company was hitting the skids and his name was completely tarnished. The damage was done. So 9,000 cars had now been produced, but they were just sitting around collecting dust in giant lots for a few years. But of course, all of this would change soon. In what happens to probably be one of the best commercials of all time. A great 60-second spot can do wonders for a product, or even impressive magazine spread, but one of, what about one of the most iconic movies ever made? One of the early concepts for the Back to the Future time machine was going to be a refrigerator, but it was thought that kids might start locking themselves in fridges. This safety issue, plus the lack of mo- mobility, made them switch it to a car, Since the DeLorean was now being trialed, it was turning a lot of heads, including those involved with this new time travel movie. One big reason for its inclusion in the movie is the script called for a car from 1985 to look like a flying saucer to the Peabody family in 1955 when Marty crashes into their barn. The design of the DeLorean helped it make uh, to look more like a flying saucer, kind of a hovering flying car when it crashed into that barn back in 1955. The stainless steel finish was also a final selling point to the Back to the Future producers. Robert Zemeckis thought also that the stainless steel finish would look really good on film, and it does. If you see either a Blu-ray or 4K version of Back to the Future, the DeLorean absolutely like jumps off the screen. Like Nothing looks better on film than this stainless steel is another one of the reasons why uh in the first scene at the mall at twin pines mall in the start of the movie why there was sort of a wet sort of mist to it because that also looks really good on film and again with the stainless steel it is just the perfect image when fitted out with a flux capacitor and all the other attachments you've got one of the coolest looking cars in history and what is essentially one of the main characters of the movie Back to the Future, of course, would end up being a massive hit, the number one grossing film of 1985, and it made the DeLorean an iconic vehicle. So here's a fun fact. A DeLorean speedometer can't hit 88 miles miles per hour. It legally had to top out at 85, so a custom dash display needed to be created just for the movie. Back to the Future, of course, created a massive resurgence in interest for the car, and many would hop on board trying to own a piece of the greatest movie of all time. Many would try to replicate the version seen in the movie by adding in all the time features and elements. Um, Can't blame them for that. The amazing thing is that this movie serves as constant marketing for the car as it will never be forgotten. It's like a 30-year-long advertisement. 
So there's a lot of main facts of the podcast. This might be the best one. You can still buy a brand new DeLorean. In 1982, before Back to the Future came out, the factory had finally closed. They were left with around 1,800 cars, and the factory was filled to the brim with every part you would ever need for a DeLorean. A company called Consolidated International swooped in to buy all the unsold cars and all the brand new parts that were just sitting in the factory. Consolidated International were not car people by any means, but they saw this as a good business deal at the time. In 1997, Stephen Wynn, who had been living in LA fixing cars, specifically European cars, would end up purchasing all the used parts. Before that, in 1982, when he was fixing all those European cars, DeLorean owners in the area were turning to him as they were having trouble with these new cars pretty much on a daily basis. This new DeLorean, as popular as it was, was a mechanical nightmare. He decided that there was enough opportunity to focus solely on fixing DeLoreans. In 1987, he ended up setting up shop in Houston, using the location as a central depot to be able to ship parts to DeLorean owners. So by 1997, Wynn had now acquired millions of DeLorean parts that now filled his 40,000 square foot building. Today, Stephen Wynn is the CEO of DeLorean Motor Company, and his focus is on sales and restoration of all things DeLorean. They sell parts to shops all around the world, and people send their DeLoreans also from all around the world to get the best repairs and maintenance possible. You could almost call them a Doc Brown. Today, they can actually put together a brand new DeLorean with brand new parts. It takes around 2,800 parts to assemble a new DeLorean, and they can do it all in their shop. They have enough parts on hand to make 500 DeLoreans. I don't know what you call a group of DeLoreans. I'd probably assume you call it a gigawatt of DeLoreans. I made that up, but it sounds pretty good. So basically, everything in there, it's like having your own factory, but it all has to be essentially almost put together by hand. But every single piece of a DeLorean is in there, from the brake pedal to parts of the engine to an exhaust pipe to um, a door lever. Like Everything is in there, enough to make 500 of them. So is that the end of the dream? Was this the ultimate um, story of failure, but then sort of a resurrection of the car? I don't know. There are many issues, but the big one that really stands out that caused the downfall of this thing was the financing. It's hard to start a brand new company that doesn't have any history and try to get this thing funded. Elon Musk has faced the same issues over the course of Tesla's history. When you go back and look at how the company started, of course, now it's such an established thing. But remember, Elon Musk started with the Roadster, and it was a high-end sports car that had a very hefty price, if you remember those when they came out. The idea with this is if he sold enough, it would help to bankroll the next editions until he got it to the point where it could be a mass-produced car for common people, like with the Model 3. The DeLorean went the same route by being marketed to higher-end clients, and that was the idea. So then he would be able to make those you know, DeLorean minivans and buses and all that stuff. But all the production issues just didn't allow for any consistency in the company. The rush to put the car out there is what led to its original demise. Given more time, the DeLorean could have been even better. Um, it would have been worked through it would have like all the bugs would have been you know taken out and it would have been more consistently marketed the car was okay as far as performance but it had that coolness factor to it which at least kept it going for a while but it honestly all comes down to back to the future in regards to any form of continued success it experienced had this movie come out in 1982 again you might be seeing delorean model threes everywhere or you might have grown up being driven around in your family's DeLorean minivan. Who knows? So this whole thing, as I wind down here, can be finished with this quote called, The End of the Dream, or Is It? Those words were written inside the right-hand door of the very last DeLorean to come off the original production line. These engineers had correctly predicted the future that would belong to this iconic car, it would be dead for the time being in 1982, but thanks to Back to the Future, this car continues to be marketed to this day, despite having gone out of business more than 30 years ago. 
So let's wrap it up there. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully you learned something new today. Or if you knew a little about this, you learned some extra new stuff. Again, it's an amazing story. If, if you go on YouTube, there's a bunch of really good documentaries all about John DeLorean. And again, it's one of these things that's just, if you can't make it up, like all the things that took place that happened and um, the, all the drug stuff and all the financing problems and the government involved. It's a crazy story. And feels like it would be a really good, you know, sort of blockbuster movie. I don't know if we'll get the big screen version of this, like a properly done version, but we'll have to wait and see. But that's it for me. Thanks for listening. I just wanted to finish. You can turn this off now if you want to take off. But if you're interested in supporting, you know, these smaller independent shows, you can check me out on patreon.com where I have... Um, you know, bonus audio content for people who support the show for as, you know, as little as a few bucks a month. And then there's different tiers. And with each tier comes a different reward. So say at the Boba Fett level, if you support at that level, you get access to the Everything 80s Movie Club. I just reviewed The Princess Bride over there if you want to check that out. So, you know, feel free to have a look. It's patreon.com slash 80s. So P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash 80S or wherever you're listening to this on, there should be a link to take you there. That's it for me, though. Thanks for taking the time to listen to the show. I will be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.